Well, hi everyone. I'm Councilmember Paul Krikorian, and I'm pleased that you could join us for the latest uh, in our webinars uh, that we've been doing. Today we're going to be talking about resources that are available for restaurants uh, during the COVID crisis, um, and I very much appreciate your, your being with us. Uh, the COVID crisis, needless to say, has had a devastating impact on small businesses throughout Los Angeles uh, and the entire uh, country. And probably no sector has been hit harder than the hospitality sector. And our restaurants throughout Los Angeles um, have suffered um, some irreparably. And we've had uh, so many restaurants that have been beloved parts of their community that have closed their doors and uh, will likely not reopen. And that's, of course, a huge impact on those entrepreneurs and business owners that put their heart and soul and life savings into these businesses. It's devastating for all of those who depend on those businesses for their jobs, for their livelihood. Uh, but it also tears apart a little bit of the fabric of our city and our community because in so many neighborhoods around Los Angeles what makes that community unique and different and interesting and vibrant and a place to to visit is its independent restaurants so um, this has been uh, this has been a, a problem uh, that affects all of us and today we're going to talk about some solutions and we're going to talk about how uh, the city is beginning to address bringing back our restaurants, making them uh, more successful even during these difficult and challenging times and helping many of these businesses to be able to survive uh, until we're into a, a fuller recovery period. So um, I'm pleased to have with me people who know uh, whereof they speak when it comes to this, uh, people who have been uh, affected by uh, this crisis, people who are envisioning the future after this crisis, and uh, people who are really making it happen right now, and hopefully setting a, a good example for other communities throughout Los Angeles. So uh, I have prep, pre excuse me, I have the pleasure of representing the East San Fernando Valley, and that of course includes the legendary NoHo Arts District, uh, a place that is one of uh, the real interesting, unique destinations for people throughout Los Angeles and visitors uh, who come to Los Angeles. And one of the things that makes the NoHo Arts District uh, so unique and interesting is its hospitality industry. And so I'm very pleased to have uh, with me, uh, first of all, Aaron Olenta, um, who is the executive director of the NoHo no Business Improvement District. Uh, and uh, he also professionally works uh, for Urban Place Consulting Group, specializing in establishing, renewing, managing, and place made making projects for business improvement districts. And certainly NoHo is one of the best examples, I think, of the kind of place making that a bid can do uh, in creating a place that uh, is a real destination. Uh, we also have with us Colin Fung. Uh, Colin was born in Macau. Uh, he arrived in Southern California from Hong Kong almost a decade ago now, and several months later opened his uh, very first uh, Tamashi Ramen House in Sherman Oaks and uh, a real example of the American dream and a great business success story. Uh, Colin now owns four restaurants in Southern California, including in the NoHo Arts District. Um, and we're gonna be speaking shortly about the experiences that Colin has gone through uh, during the pandemic. And then uh, finally, we have with us Rose McCarran, who, who is a supervising transportation planner with the Vision Zero Planning Division at LA Department of Transportation. And uh, she is responsible for implementing programs, including safe routes to school and great streets. Uh, but recently, uh, she's focused on LADOT's emergency response to COVID-19. And one of those responses is what we're going to be talking about primarily today, which is the LA Alfresco program. And so uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, really delighted to be able to have this opportunity for us uh, to chat and to share experiences. Um, 
Aaron, I, I'd like to start with you, and, and I'd like to ask you to reflect a little bit about um, why independent restaurants matter uh, to a community. What is it, uh, both in terms of economics, in terms of placemaking, uh, why does it matter that we continue to have independent restaurants and not just chains uh, throughout Los Angeles? Yeah, thanks for having, uh, having me, Councilmember Kokorian. Appreciate it. Independent restaurants, uh, they make a district unique. And I think the NoHo Arts District is, is extremely unique in all the districts around Los Angeles, all the different business improvement districts. Um, yeah, they're the, the, the fabric of you know, what makes up a, a unique arts district that makes it different from uh, a neighboring district and wants to you know, attract people, bring people in, why people want to visit and go there. So Cullen's Restaurant is you know, one of those examples that we have there. So in NoHo, for example, um, there's uh, quite a stretch of, of restaurants. There's a number of uh, stretches of restaurants around. And uh, as people come to the area to visit those restaurants, presumably other businesses uh, benefit from that as well. Um, businesses tend to come and locate in places that have the amenities that NoHo has to offer, and that's why uh, the office buildings, for example, right across the street from Collins Restaurant and other places uh, are such attractive places for, for other businesses to be as well, right? Because people are looking for the kind of walkable community, the kind of place where they can go out and enjoy that restaurant experience. Yeah, and North Hollywood, specifically the arts district, has really developed into that, into that walkable district that you can, you can take a metro in, you can walk a block or two and find a, a, a restaurant like the Federal Bar uh, that is completely different and unique from other communities around here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, North Hollywood has a lot of, a lot of good bones in the, these uh, independent restaurants, you know, or make up uh, actually a third of the businesses in the NoHo Arts District. Hmm. So, so I, I was often uh, bragging about the NoHo Arts District prior to COVID about what a, a terrific, uh, vibrant business uh, area it is, uh, what an attractive place it is for people to come to visit uh, and to work. And uh, then COVID hit and like areas around Los Angeles, um, the safer at home orders and uh, people's reluctance to go out, uh, you know, the people's concerns about their own safety um, was obviously very impactful. Can you talk a little bit about how the the arts district overall was impacted. Oh, it's still impacted. I mean, I think every community and every business district, every commercial district around LA and throughout the country is impacted throughout the world. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I think we all would just wish this pandemic would end. Um, yeah. yeah, we've really gone, gone from just like, you know, being caught off guard with everything to just a, a management, um, you know, portion of this now mm -hmm. and just dealing with it on every everyday basis. Yeah, it's, it's been extremely difficult extremely, extremely difficult. So I, we're grateful for programs like DOTs and the Alfresco program that, you know, have give us sort of a lifeline, give mm -hmm. the restaurants a lifeline to keep operating. So Colin, if I can go to you for a minute, um, your restaurant was uh, doing tremendously. Uh, you were doing so well that you were able to open up additional restaurants. Uh, it's a mainstay in the neighborhood. It's a, a place that's known to folks not only in NoHo, but in surrounding areas to come. Um, then the Safer at Home orders came, and you were essentially, with almost no notice, uh, expected to pretty much close up. Um, can you talk a little bit about those first few weeks of the Safer at Home orders and how it impacted you? Yeah, uh, on the uh, I still remember on the 16th of March, you know, when the uh, governor announced this is no more in, indoor dining. So I was like, uh, I was shot, you know, because my my what I'm doing is the ramen, you know, but ramen is a hard sell dishes for to go, you know. So we more like a sit down, a soup with noodle and topping uh, uh, cuisine, you know. So I was like, what am I gonna do, you know? So. The, the first thing I, 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 I'm, what I'm doing, I have to uh, contact my supplier to cut down the, uh, the, the, the supply, you know, uh, supposed to deliver to us at the first week. And then secondly, I need to re rearrange, uh, rearrange the, uh, my, my staff, the, uh, the schedule, because I cannot afford to have so many staff 
if my my restaurant was closed you know so um so i i uh and secondly i i i call my landlord you know so whether they intend to uh, reduce the rent or maybe any we can work on something you know get us through this difficult time you know but uh my my all location the landlord and the management they all say no you know so what nothing i can do you know so uh then I start to look for some uh, local uh, uh, and uh, state any funding, like the SBA and uh, any support from the, uh, the 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 federal, you know. So, and then uh, got that I able to get the uh, PPP, and then when I got the PPP, then I able to make a plan for what I'm gonna do in the next couple of weeks, you know. Uh, I understand that the purpose of the PPP, and then I able to keep uh, most of my employee stay at the same job, and then they able to uh, to get paid to support mm. their family, you know. But still, my ramen still is not the uh, uh, the, the dishes is good for delivery, you know, because the longer the the noodles sit inside the soup, they will get very mushy. Sure. So I need to. Uh, uh, change the menu right away, increase more rice dishes, increase more salad, increase more sushi dishes, something that can stay a little bit longer from my restaurant to someone's home. And then I make contact with the uh, uh, social media and uh, like Facebook and uh, Instagram to so telling my customer that we still open but for takeout and for delivery and then hope with their loyalty, they're able to come back to support me to get this through, you know. So uh, that's at the, uh, what happened at the really beginning. So it must have been, uh, first of all, a shock to you to see such a dramatic drop in business uh, almost overnight. Um, but the story that you just described is a story that's been replicated in restaurant businesses uh, across our city. And it, it wasn't just your loss it was a loss to your supplier uh, and everyone else in the supply chain uh, who provides you with food, with uh, all of the other uh, items that you have to procure to run your business, all of that is hurt as well. Obviously your employees uh, are hurt, devastated, and you have to often, restaurants across Los Angeles laying off a significant part of their workforce. Um, so then the, the other businesses that those employees would normally be frequenting are also hurt because they don't have the income to be able to go and patronize those businesses. You mentioned your landlord. In this case, um, you didn't get a lot of help and support, but there are uh, businesses across Los Angeles that are trying to work with their the property owner to try to um, either stretch out or avoid or reduce rents. So that's having an impact on the property owner and all of the economic um, follow-on that comes from that as well. So it, it, this really is a tremendous ripple effect that crosses all parts of the economy of Los Angeles. It's not just the owners of the restaurants themselves. And uh, you mentioned the PPP loans, which many businesses took advantage of immediately. Uh, in addition to the PPP program, the city of Los Angeles initiated an $11 million microloan program, uh, which is available and, and remains available to businesses uh, that are struggling because of COVID-19. Um, that allows for loans up to $20,000 for small businesses to help them get through uh, as kind of a lifeline through these difficult times. Um, and there are a number of other programs similar to, to that uh, through the county as well. So um, you mentioned that you had to reconfigure your, your menu. You were using social media to try to get uh, people to come for pickup. Uh, but what I'm sure what you really wanted was to get back to normal, to having people come and visit your restaurant and be able to enjoy the restaurant experience, not just the excellent food, but the experience of being there and, and dining with you. And uh, that's where 
L.A. Al Fresco comes in. And so I'd like to go now, if I can, uh, to Rosemary and uh, ask, um, just tell us a little bit about what the L.A. Al Fresco program is and how it came about, please. Sure, thank you. Um, it became very obvious as the pandemic hit, we were seeing restaurants like Collins struggle. And so the city tried to think about what existing resources we have that could help support these restaurants. Um, and so we came up with the Alfresco program, which creates four different options for restaurants to take advantage of outdoor space to make sure they can keep the diners safe while still allowing patrons to come and visit restaurants. So we were looking at existing assets that we already have that we could provide at low cost. And we have a lot of programs that allow for outdoor dining, um, but we had to sort of tailor them and modify them to get them through um, quickly and at no cost to the applicant. So the four options for al fresco are sidewalk dining. So that's putting tables and chairs in, in front of the frontage of your restaurant, um, leaving five feet of space for pedestrians to go by. And another option is use of private property. So if there's a private parking lot or a private patio or some other place um, on your on the property of your restaurant where you currently weren't uh, licensed to serve food, we now opened up that option, as well as waiving parking requirements to allow um, businesses to operate in those spaces. Those are the two most popular options for Al Fresco, and they're wildly popular. It takes about 18 minutes to apply online, and you get an authorization right away at no cost. Um, so it, it because. Uh most of these options involve um, reduction in parking availability. Uh, this program was really made possible by the, um, the confluence of events, the fact that restaurants were suffering, uh, they couldn't have the outdoor dining, but also people were not driving as much, there wasn't as much need for parking on our streets, and there wasn't as much uh, need for the the through traffic uh, capacity that that we would normally have, and so that was one benefit. If if we have to find a silver lining in all of this, one benefit was people were driving less, and that allowed the opportunity to take better advantage of the public space in the public right of way. Exactly. Yes, and we know those options don't really serve everyone. So you know, really, the largest public. Um, asset we have as a city is our streets. They make up about 18% of the city's total landmass. So um, in addition, LADOT has opened up the street for two options. We have curbside dining, and that typically serves one restaurant, taking about two spaces on the street um, to create a smaller dining area. And then we also offer dining on the street, which is um, a larger closure of the street. And that can be executed in a few different ways. Um, that can be uh, just closing the parking lane for a, for a full block. It could be going further and closing a travel lane to create even more space. Or in some, some circumstances, people are interested in closing the whole street, so taking a whole block mm -hmm. and using that area for dining. So I have, to give, um, I have to give high praise to you and to the LA Department of Transportation because even before LA Al Fresco started, uh, DOT jumped right in to try to help restaurants, helping them with um, uh, pick up and drop off locations so that um, people could, could grab their food to go, um, changing parking signage and so on to allow that. Um, that was almost immediately after uh, the, the uh, Safer at Home orders went into effect. And then that kind of evolved and grew into this really terrific program and again as you mentioned it only takes 15 minutes or so to apply online and DOT responds exceptionally quickly in fact so much so that uh, when we were prepared to open the alfresco program in the NoHo Arts District um, the K rails started to get delivered uh, and it was ready to go before we even knew that it was ready to launch. That, it, that's how fast it went. And we actually have a little bit of a video clip that kind of talks a little bit about the, uh, the Alfresco program and how it's rolled out in the NoHo Arts District. So if we go to that clip now, please. 
over to the new alfresco permit. Um, the patio is being constructed right now. It's going to be 100 feet. It's beautiful in my opinion. We're hoping that the beauty of it brings people back to the neighborhood. I really do feel like the alfresco has first of all brought the community together. For some reason we're all working together and we're excited to have something to look forward to. And it's also going to help with more seats for us that could to bring up some revenue. Try to make it through till the till the end of the COVID coronavirus. We're trying to get people to come out and have some fun and be pleasant with each other. Tough times. We're trying to bring uh, those measures to the streets here in North Hollywood. And uh, what the city's done here for us has been great. It's a good opportunity for anyone who's lost business inside, which we have up to 40% of our business uh, we're compensating for. So the Alfresco permit will definitely give us that, that boost and that jump, hopefully. So when we get into 2021, you know, things might, might not be too bad. So the uh, NoHo Arts District uh, LA Alfresco program, I believe, was the first one in the city that actually involved uh, closure of traffic lanes to accommodate uh, restaurant seating. Is that is that true? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So that obviously raises some issues uh, for people, and uh, you have spent a good part of your career in trying to keep people safe from automotive traffic. Uh, so what kind of steps does DOT take to ensure that with this kind of a model, diners will be safe from the, tr the through traffic that continues uh, to pass by on the street? That's a great question. So we are, you know, it really is a balancing act. We do want to support restaurants and businesses while keeping our constituents safe and um, you know, making sure that everyone has a comfortable experience on the street. So with our curbside dining areas, we typically limit them to streets that are 25 miles an hour or less, or perhaps 30 miles an hour with a bike lane separation from the traffic so that people feel protected. Um, we're using less, um, the materials we're using are more uh, equipped to handle those lower speed limits. When it comes to doing a full closure, then we're getting into using more heavy duty equipment such as K-rails. Um, so those are those things you see when a building's coming up for construction and they're closing part of the road, they use those either concrete barriers or plastic barriers filled with water. So our engineers make a judgment based on the speed of the street and their, um, their safety assessment, what type of materials we'll use to close the street. So we ideally um, will close it with those K-rails, try to have as few gaps as possible. You know, there are driveways, people do wanna access things. Um, so these closures are fairly difficult to execute. There's a lot of things to balance. Um, but, you know, we're, we are really keeping in mind safety and comfort for people because nobody, nobody will enjoy their dining experience if they don't feel safe. Well, and similarly, in areas uh, that don't involve a a full lane closure, uh, but involve more sidewalk dining um, or parking lot dining, you know, the, the, where they're not actually out into the street. Um, the other issue that that raises in some places is pedestrian accessibility. Um, so how are you ensuring that um, once a restaurant starts to set up on the sidewalk, we're still guaranteeing um, that there's accessible pedestrian, uh, there's, there's, there's enough room in the right of way for accessible pedestrian uh, uh, traffic through the area. Right, so as part of the application process, we out outline all of the requirements for the program. And for sidewalk dining, one of those requirements is that uh, they must leave at least five feet of a pedestrian walkway. Um, so we allow applicants to self-certify and sign to really roll out this program with this like urgent demand that there is to support these restaurants. So we have inspectors who go out um, and do spot checks. We also respond to complaints. Um, we give restaurants the opportunity to correct those complaints if, if they are issued a notice of violation. Um, after three notices of violation, uh, we will revoke the authorization for sidewalk dining. But we haven't had to do that as, as of yet. So, you know, we really just request that restaurants are respectful of the guidelines to keep that five feet open for today. Terrific. Thank you. Um, let me go back to, to Aaron and Colin for a minute. Um, 
So uh, talk a little bit about the experience, uh, the, the bids role in this, and Colin, you and your restaurant's role in applying for the program. Um, what was it like to, what was the experience like to go through? Did you have a lot of hoops that you had to jump through? Um, uh, just talk a little bit about that experience of, of applying and also what happened between when you applied and when you started serving diners. I'll, I'll call and go first real quick on this. Um, so the, the NoHo bid helped facilitate the process um, in the beginning and bring all the parties together from the business owners like Colin, uh, the property owners on the street, uh, council member, your office, uh, DOT, and that was really our role. Um, Nancy Bianconi from NoHo Communications Group, um, who's been uh, the godmother of NoHo, uh, was really critical too in bringing a lot of the parties together as well. She knows everybody. Um, and then from your office, uh, Sahag Yadalian was huge. And he really spearheaded this project and really shepherded this project along from just an idea um, to the actual implementation, which happened so quickly, like you mentioned. And uh, thank you, Rosemary, too, for for just this, this program in general, for how quickly you guys worked on this. So, how much of a how much of a time span are we talking about from the time that the application uh, went in until uh, you were up and running? I, I'd Colin, say you, it feels like less than a month, probably. But Colin, I'll let you let you jump on on this. Uh, when I first heard about the. Uh, a place they can uh, block a row and then let the restaurant and bar put the table and chair outside. And then I noticed the old town Pasadena. It happened, you know. Let's sometime go back to July, you know. So, and then later on, sometime August in uh, downtown Bourbon, they did the same thing, you know. So, and then I was thinking like, when is my term, you know? So I talked to uh, Nancy and then I talked to Saha. I say, can, can we do something? At that time, I have no hope because I think McNory is, is a busy street. You know, it's not like uh, not like downtown uh, uh, San Fernando. You know, they're more like a walking district, a lot of restaurants, a lot of walking traffic. But McNory between Lancashire and Wyland, uh, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I have a really, really little hope, you know. But things just, just went on really fast, you know, from the first day I talked to Saha until I able to put table and chair outside within a month, you know. So this is the first time, wow, this city, you know, because I never experienced so fast for something the city they did, you know. So thank you so much for all the hard work for Saha and uh, for, for, uh, for you, councilman, and for all your team, you know. But I can tell, uh, uh, since we put the uh, table and chair out and then I did a little bit of a decoration, put some carpet, put some uh, uh, plant as a flensing, I put some uh, string light on top, make a little bit a uh, good ambience, you know. Um, my business, it was bad like 30 percent, you know, so I can see this significantly improvement for the uh, restaurant and bar. So I keep talking to my next door do something, it help, you know, because I'm the first one to put something out. And then later on, I can see the Fed Dog, I can see the uh, uh, 351, I can see the uh, Altahano, they even doing a massive project, you know, like they building a new restaurant. I say, <laughs> I can't <laughs> afford it, you know, so, but I could then I can see everybody now, they slowly, they get, they, they realize that this is very important for their business. Mm. So. It is really helpful, but it's just a matter of for the last 10 days, last week, the uh, the weather, the air quality is just too bad, you know. So mm -hmm. you know, we don't get a lot of business at the daytime because of the entire the valley is really smoky, you know. So, but nighttime after 8 p.m., I can see a lot of people, they walk, they take a seat, you know. So uh, honest, my, my business was, I can see a big improvement. Did I understand you to say that since you've had Al Fresco in place, uh, your business has gone up thirty percent? Yes, yes, that's terrific. That's just great, yes. and and it's 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 terrific to hear that the process itself was uh, fast 
and efficient and uh, not too many hoops to, to jump through. Um, so Rosemary, if I can go back to you for, for a minute, I, uh, as I understand it, uh, you're getting fair, you at DOT are getting fairly inundated with applications and requests now from across the city. Um, can you give us a sense of, you know, what's up and running, what your backlog of applications is? Give us just a sense of scale of the program, if you could. Sure. Um, to date, we have installed 50 curbside dining areas, and those are spread across the city. Those are the smaller dining areas. Um, and we've also installed five closures. Um, there's the one in North Hollywood. There's one in Little Tokyo on First Street. There's one in Lamert Park on Degnan. Um, there's one on Sunset Boulevard. And then there is a final one on Windward um, in Venice, close to the beach. So um, that's, that's where our focus is right now, is getting those closures out. Um, since initially we rolled out those parklets pretty quickly, and now we're catching up on those closures. Um, you know, we probably have double the applications of what we've installed right now. Um, so there is a lot of demand for the program, and we're, we're doing our best to keep up with it. Uh, you mentioned parklets, and that's um, a phrase that we understand, but maybe a, a restaurant owner out there might not uh, know what that is. That's, that's a more limited closure where you're simply taking away a few parking spaces and replacing those parking spaces with uh, a safe extension into the street for, for dining areas. Is that, is that right? That's right. That's we, we're also referring to it as curbside dining area to have something that's a little more friendly and not as jargony as what we use internally at LADOT. Yeah. So sorry, parklet slipped out. But it's um, <laughs> it's it's technically taking. It's typically two spaces. It usually only serves one business um, and just takes those two parking spaces. Um, however, if you have a business next door or you have a particularly large frontage and there's you know, a third space we could take up. You know, we, we, try, we do our best to try to accommodate people with as much space as we can. Uh, that kind of a closure, I assume, is uh, quicker to implement than when you're actually closing off through traffic in a traffic lane, which has much more safety implications and traffic implications. And that's, it's a more complicated job for DOT, I assume, if you're, if you're shutting down a traffic lane. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. There was a lot of work that went into Magnolia, including changing the striping on the street, putting up signs, making sure that signals would still work properly, yeah. Now, I know there are other areas around that don't necessarily involve the right-of-way, um, but they have a parking lot or some adjacent area on their property, which, um, because of their CUP or otherwise, had been designated for parking. Um, talk a little bit about how restaurants can utilize that kind of space. Right. Well, that um, that's another thing like the sidewalk dining where you can instantly get approved to use that space. You just need permission from the property owner, of course. Um, but there's no limitations to what you can use there. The city's trying to be as flexible as possible with what businesses do. We're just trying to get you the authorization and, and help you get going. Um, so so really, as long as you have permission from the property owner and the space is available, you can use that for dining. So are there any limitations on this program that a potential applicant should know about in advance? Uh, things that will not be permitted or space that will not be permitted to use or, or a use that uh, LA Alfresco will not accept? Yes, there's a few limitations. Um, one of them is if you're near a residential area, you are required to stop operating at 10.30 p.m. just to make sure that the residents have peace and they're able to go to sleep. Um, we're, it's not permitted to have any private events or charge a cover or do anything to use that, you know, most of the alfresco is in public space, and so we're, you know, we're making sure that you're not charging to use our public space. Um, other things like TVs, live shows, 
um, you know, we were really just trying to commit this area to dining only um, and not other, other entertainment uses. Um, and again, with the sidewalk dining, you do have to maintain that five feet of space mm. for pedestrians. Now, you mentioned um, some full street closures that uh, may be in the works or that are being considered. Um, uh, those are the sorts of things that, um, uh, well, let me, let me go back a step. Most of the alfresco uh, uh, projects that are already underway are intended to be temporary projects during the course of the COVID pandemic, right? I mean, they're, they're extending now through the end of the year? That's correct, yes. And uh, that's important for people to know be, for the reasons that you just described. Many times neighbors may have com some concerns that um, if this becomes a permanent thing in certain areas, that may uh, mean that some of the conditions that they worked hard for in a CUP are not being complied with, for example, for the, for the long run. Um, but this is a temporary program. Um, but there may be places where it might be appropriate to extend the term or even make it permanent. And some of the street closures that you're looking at, I assume, would be in the latter category. These might be places where um, we're creating people streets or otherwise um, shutting off to traffic uh, a street in order to make it a real destination that benefits, yes, the restaurants, but also is part of the placemaking that we were talking about earlier with Aaron. Is, is that part of the plan? Yes, I mean, it's definitely something we're exploring. I mean, we've seen the popularity of Al Fresco. About 2,000 restaurants are taking advantage of this program thus far. Um, and so we've, le we've received a lot of questions about what happens when the orders are lifted and will it go away. Um, you know, I think the city is interested and open to extending um, this program, but I think we have to be really thoughtful about how we do it because, you know, as I said, we've tried to streamline and make things as expeditious as possible. Um, and I think there, there are more concerns and probably more engagement um, with the communities that would be needed before we made these, these mm -hmm. changes. Aaron, if I, on that point, if I could go back to you for a minute. Uh, now that you've seen what has, um, uh, what, what has happened in NoHo since the Alfresco program arrived, how do you see uh, the future of this kind of thing? What, what would be your expectations of um, this kind of dining experience? And, and do you think that there may be an opportunity to do more permanent expansion of the public right of way like this in order to create more walkable, uh, livable communities? Yeah, I think I actually got several expectations in the program. I think the first off is that it helps the restaurant survive you know, gets them through the pandemic, um, avoid the loss of business and, you know, help mitigate those indoor closures that are going on right now. Um, I, I think we'd like to see the program spur economic activity throughout the whole district. I know other commercial districts are the out of that door space and usage. Um, and then I expect to be there to be uh, increased pedestrian activity throughout the entire NoHo Arts District because of the program. Uh, I'm hoping it expands and uh, I know there's some other locations along Lancashire and another spot on Magnolia that have recently applied uh, to bring the Alfresco program to, to those streets as, on a smaller scale, not taking a lane away, but using parking. And then I think ultimately, um, I'd like to see the Alfresco program become permanent um, and something that DOT can have in their toolbox uh, going forward for their placemaking portfolio. Yeah, it, you know, sometimes uh, people hear about um, lane closures and they have very strong adverse reactions, as Rosemary, I'm sure, has experienced many times uh, in her career in a variety of ways. And um, I, I think one of the things that I hope that one of the things that the success of L LA Alfresco will do is to demonstrate that sometimes taking a lane away from traffic, uh, from automotive traffic, um, maybe that will cause uh, 
little bit of uh, slowing of traffic, which in my view is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, it doesn't need to create a congestion problem it, if it's managed correctly. Um, it doesn't need to create gridlock. But what it can do is present a real opportunity for all of us to be able to enjoy uh, the publicly owned space uh, much more than we, we do now simply by watching cars uh, zip through it. Um, this, we have not, it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Colin, uh, in your experience or Aaron, but what have the adverse impacts been of this? Have, have you noticed any problems of significant congestion in the area or uh, in, any problems like that? Or um, ha has it been pretty smooth as far as people adjusting to it? As far as I see, it's been smooth so far since it's been up and running. We're, we're monitoring it daily. But yeah, for, for my, our experience, it's been smooth. And, and Rosemary, I, I don't know if there have been other examples yet that have been implemented of the lane closure or if the other projects you mentioned are still in the works, but what has DOT's experience been in terms of traffic impacts, congestion impacts? So far, the only other closure that involved a travel lane was in Little Tokyo on First Street. And there we were able to take advantage of, there was already metro construction in the region that, uh, for the regional connector. And so there was a lane of traffic already removed. And so right as metro was going to put that lane of traffic back, we were able to, to sneak in and keep that lane for Alfresco. Um, so at the moment, we haven't received any complaints or seen any um, severe traffic impacts. Like. Very good. Um, Colin, there's probably other restaurant owners uh, now who are, are watching this program. What message would you have for them about the Alfresco program uh, that, uh, you know, based on your experience, what, what would you like to tell other restaurant owners about this? First of all, take the advantage, you know, of the uh, Alfresco dining, you know, and then as much you can to make your space a little bit more nice you know and then you will i'm 100 you will bring the business will be coming back and then you're able to hire more uh, employee you can create more job you know so uh everybody need to give a li little bit of uh effort you know we still have hope you know not the end of the day you know the indoor is closed it's a smaller door but you got a big doors open for you you know so Need to be strong. Thank you. Uh, and it, it's important to remember that because in a time like this, it's easy for, uh, for all of us to start to uh, feel like there's no end to it and feel a little bit hopeless. And then we see opportunities like this. And I think it does give people confidence that there are uh, bright, uh, lights ahead. There are ways that we can get through this. There, uh, the, the pandemic will end. Um, and if we're smart, if we're creative, uh, if um, we are persistent, uh, we can develop uh, projects like this that will help businesses to flourish and help neighborhoods as well. Um, so, uh, Aaron, in terms of uh, the restaurant community, in North Hollywood. Um, the, one of the unique things about the NoHo Arts District is that it has so many very unique restaurants. It is not a place that's filled with a lot of, you know, uh, fast food joints and chains. It has very interesting, unique, sit-down uh, restaurants on, along Lancashire, along Magnolia. Um, have uh, how have they been doing overall through this? Have, have, have there been any that have had to close? Um, are they uh, beginning to feel as though they're able to come back now? And um, what has the, um, the impact on the restaurants in the community done to the larger business community in the area? Yeah, I think everyone's just still in the survival phase right now, Council Member. Um, 
Yeah, and I can it, it's fine. I can count the number of chain restaurants in the NoHo Arts District on my hand. Actually, there's there's really not that many. We're fortunate. Um, yeah, right, restaurants are critical to I think any business district survival. Like I mentioned, we have a third of our district's businesses are restaurants, and I think they're really on the larger community. Their impact um, is there. You know, if people come to a district, in my opinion, mostly to go to dine. And it's, there's sort of a ripple or like a multiplier effect in a positive way upon other businesses. So for example, you have a couple coming in to eat, going out to dinner, and they go to Tamashi. They're, they're planning to go to dinner there. They go to Tamashi, uh, spend money there, and they decide to go to a show, say at the Whitmore Lindley Theater. Um, they walk uh, you know, a block or two, go to the Whitmore Lindley, spend money there, see a show, and then decide to go and get a drink before they head home, go to the uh, Brew Brothers or the Federal Bar. For a drink, spend money there, and then um, hop back on Metro and leave. So it has a, a multiplier ripple effect on everybody. They're, they're a critical component of uh, a commercial district's infrastructure. Yeah, and um, you know, a lot of the more uh, interesting creative industries, tech industries, and so on, when they're looking for a place to site a business, um, when they're looking for a place where they're going to take four floors of an office building to come and, and establish their headquarters, for example, they're looking for those sorts of amenities. They're looking for a place that their employees will want to go to work, will, will want to be able to walk out and experience that kind of an environment at lunch, stay at the conclusion of the workday. Um, and the NoHo Arts District certainly offers that now. Uh, but I dare say if the restaurants were to all close, if they were to be replaced with other types of businesses, um, it would it would tear at the heart of what makes it a unique place, and um, yeah. and there's so many other places like that throughout Los Angeles. That and and Rosemary, you mentioned a number of them when you were talking about some of the alfresco projects uh, that are going on throughout the city. Terrific places like Lamert Park and uh, and other places that really have a sense of place, and without those unique neighborhood serving, uh, independent restaurant businesses, they wouldn't be the same kind of place. So this, this really does matter to, um, to the broader business community in, in the area. Fair to say? 100%. Um, so uh, I want to talk um, a little bit now about a different program just as we, we wrap this up uh, because as we begin to emerge from uh, COVID-19 and as businesses begin to reopen, people are going to be investing again in new businesses, new restaurants, um, and uh, it's really important that the city of Los Angeles tries to uh, do the best that we can to encourage that kind of investment so that we expedite the economic recovery and expedite getting people back to work. Um, so, uh, Colin, I don't know. Do you have um, a license to, to serve alcohol? Yes, I do. Okay. So, can you talk a little bit about how hard it was for you to to get that, and what what the process was like when you were first opening up to to go through that process? Uh. My experience was I, I built a, a several restaurant when I uh, moved to the United States, but I found the most difficult part is the processing to uh, to open a restaurant, you know, it, it's so long, you know. Uh, the day that you submit the plan check, the day that you have the inspector come on site to uh, uh, check all your plumbing, all your electrical, for me it looks like Especially consider the place where I'm coming from Hong Kong, you know, we're very more speedy, you know, so but in here it takes too long, you know, so for example, the, the, the landlord, they only give me two months is for the fee rent for the construction. But they always take like four months, you know, so without making money, another two more months, I have to uh, put money from my pocket, you know, so. Right. I wish if uh, in the, in the future uh, we can be able to uh, speed up the process of uh, any uh, application. The, the sooner I can get a a, a permit, I, I the sooner I open the restaurant. The sooner I can create more job. You know, so right. 
and also when 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 consider to uh, apply for uh, alcohol license uh um it's it's talking about six months you know and then it's talking about a lot of uh down payment you know and then i don't think a lot of the smaller business they able to up fund like eighteen thousand twenty thousand for a bny license so if the abc or not the abc of the city they will consider to do a little bit better to help the uh, the restaurant or bar business to move a little bit fast and then it will help you know so mm-hmm. i heard about the uh, the beverage program going back sometime in uh, april and may but just off the sudden i don't hear anything what's going to be happen I, well, I i'm going to tell you be... about that <laughs> okay <laughs> but um but your your experience is a great example because most people who want to um, make their dream a reality and open up their restaurant uh, as an independent entrepreneur, most people will have a lot of trouble carrying the rent for six months or longer without serving a single customer because they're still waiting for permits, they're waiting for approvals, they're waiting for their plan checks, they're waiting for all of the steps that you have to to go through. Um, And so the void ends up getting filled by big corporate chains uh, that can't afford to do that and who understand the process. And so um, you get more and more cities across America looking like every other city because the big chains are filling up Main Street um, and, uh, and taking over all these business opportunities. So I think businesses like yours, as we've dis- discussed throughout this program, are critical to making a place unique. And um, it's the rare person who can uh, see through all of the challenges that cities put in their way in order to to get open. So one of those big challenges, of course, is the time delay that it takes uh, to get a conditional use permit for the sale of alcoholic beverages on site. And that's for good reason, because we want to protect neighborhoods. We want to make sure that we don't have um, places that are are selling alcohol and creating a problem in the neighborhood, um, who are violating ABC regulations and all the other things. That's why we have a CUP process, a conditional use permit process in the first place that has a public hearing aspect to it and all of that. But what we have found is that at the end of all that, at the end of those many, many months of process, at the end of spending, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars in permit fees and more on lawyers and everything else, that we end up in the same place that we could have agreed to at the beginning, uh, with the same kinds of conditions uh, in restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. So uh, I've initiated. Uh, a new policy, uh, which hopefully will be passing through the council soon. Uh, It has to still be heard by the Plum Committee and then go to the full council, uh, by which if a restaurant agrees to a set of conditions that are more protective of the community than 80% of the CUPs that we actually grant, uh, if they agree to those conditions up front, we can expedite that process slash the fees uh, from $13,000 down to around $4,000, cut the time from six to eight to nine months down to a matter of weeks, and we can help restaurants in the aftermath of this pandemic get up and running, uh, start hiring people back to work, um, and creating the kinds of environments that we've discussed that are the places that make neighborhoods and make communities uh, in a much more expedited way. So hopefully we'll have more business people like you, more entrepreneurs like you who want to come into Los Angeles and make their dream a reality right here in LA. So um, right now that program has not yet been passed by the council. I hope that it will soon. Um, And I think this is a a terrific way to be able to protect neighborhoods, but also get out of the way of 
people who want to invest in communities, invest in creating jobs, uh, invest in creating places that we all want to, to go and visit and enjoy. And, and that's the goal of the program. So hopefully uh, uh, others, other businesses will be able to enjoy the benefits of that soon once it uh, progresses through uh, the council process. Um, there are an array of different uh, programs that are available to provide grant funding and loan funding to our small businesses. Um, we have lists of those programs that are available on my website at paulcricorian.org. Um, so if you are watching this and wondering about what other resources may be available for businesses in the city of Los Angeles, I hope you'll visit my website and, uh, and we have the list for you there. Um, those will all be important to get through this tough time. Uh, but what really is going to matter for businesses is, uh, as we emerge from this, continuing to create a city that encourages investment and encourages uh, entrepreneurs to, to open up uh, rather than finding ways to say no. And we're continuing to, to work on that. And I think that the Alfresco program has been a terrific example of that kind of change in atmosphere around City Hall. And uh, Rosemary, I think you, you hit it on the head when you said that this is something that the city really sees as being an important thing to get done right now more than ever uh, when people are struggling to get back to work. So I want to thank you all very much for, uh, for having this conversation with me. Any last thoughts that anybody would like to offer to the, to the entrepreneurs who are watching today, to the potential restaurant owners or the restaurant owners who are struggling? Any last thoughts for, uh, before we go? Aaron? I would just say take advantage of the Alfresco program, uh, why it's there, and hopefully it becomes permanent in the future. And Very thank you, Council Member, and thank you, uh, LADOT. Yes. Thank you. Colin, any last thoughts for your, um, for your colleagues out there in the restaurant world? I think you, as, as Aaron said, you know, take advantage of the uh, Alfresco School Dining, and uh, you, will, you will be okay. Very good, very good. Well, thank you all again very much for, for being with us. And Rosemary, uh, again, I want to thank you and the Department of Transportation. What you've done in a very short amount of time in responding to an emergency really gives people hope uh, and it gives them confidence that the city of Los Angeles is here to help them and to help businesses flourish and to help our economy get back on its feet. So thank you very much for all you've done for us in NoHo, but all that you're doing uh, for the Alfresco program across the city as well. And thanks for your support. My pleasure. So thank you all very much, uh, everyone who's tuned in today. Uh, it was great to have you join us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Until then, I'm Paul Krikorian. Thank you very much.